Hello folks, welcome back to Physics with Captain Rod. Uh, <clears throat> I'm making this video to just kind of overview uh, electric flux and Gauss's law. I think these are very difficult concepts for people to comprehend. Uh, Gauss's law is uh, hinged on the concept of flux. So the first thing I want to I want to do is go over flux again. So electric flux, basically in, a, in an algebraic sense, here's how it's calculated, right? The symbol for electric flux is this thing, Greek letter phi. It's basically field strength times area, but it's got a kicker. The electric field that you need to use is always the component that's perpendicular to the area, right? And, uh, and I'll talk about why here in a minute. So, you know, it has to do with um, what flux measures. Effectively, what flux uh, tells us about is the number of field lines that are going through a given area. So, in the examples that I have above here, I got two examples, one on the left, one on the right. So we have this circle here, and it has a certain cross-sectional area. And imagine a uniform electric field. I drew one electric field vector kind of up and right, but imagine a uniform electric field in this region. So any sort of surface should have a normal, that's the green vector, and this is just a direction. See, that's a little caret symbol over it, means unit vector. So the normals of this is uh, up in this example. So the electric flux through this surface, right, we would take the electric field whoops, times the area here. But when you look at this, all right, this electric field, if we think about it in terms of components, it has a component parallel to the area and a component perpendicular. The perpendicular one is the one that uh, creates flux. So when we did this, if we were to do this calculation, we would take E cosine theta. Yeah, write this out in black. So E cosine theta would give us the component of this electric field that's in the direction of the normal. Then we would multiply by the area of the loop. Now, if the electric field is constant and the area is uh, not changing in orientation, you know, this is good enough. However, you know, in a lot of cases, the electric field isn't constant. So when I look over to the right, here's another example, and I drew multiple uh, electric fields basically at the same area. And the thing to realize is now that the electric field, I'm going to do this in uh, blue, the electric field here is not the same as here, is not the same as here, and so forth. So, if we were to do an electric flux calculation, you know, this requires a little bit stronger math. And conceptually, basically, it works like this. We would think of it, we would break the problem up into little pieces. Each piece has an area that we would normally call, uh, we'll say, dA. Right. If I pick a location, say right here, this guy, there is a normal at that location, which would point this way. And again, we have some sort of area or angle now, theta, between the electric field and the normal. So the flux through that this little piece right there, the flux through that little piece can be written the electric field at that location, um, times cosine of the angle between the normal and the electric field times the area of this little loop here. Now, if we imagine these being finite, um, measurable quantities, you know, we might call that something like uh, delta A, or, or I sometimes call it maybe A sub I. I think that'd be probably a better thing to call it. I'll say A sub I where the A sub I is the finite measurable area here. Um, then what we would do is we would sum these all up. So the total electric flux we would get by summing up all of these things. So that would look something like this. Keeping in mind that in theory the, the electric field is varying with location, the angle, and therefore the cosine of the angle. And then this, you know, may or may not be the same areas. It depends on how, you know, you break it up. So this is how we would find the flux uh, in an algebraic sense. In a, in a calculus sense, right, we would describe the flux uh, maybe in a little, with a little bit stronger math. So in a calculus sense, what we do is we define a new vector called, you know, the dA vector. That's what I always call this thing. It has um, magnitude of area, dA, and it's in the direction of the normal. So this E cosine theta times A, well, if we say the magnitude here is a differential area, then this becomes uh, 
E cosine theta um, times, uh, well, the magnitude of dA. And let, me, let me just do this. Let's say magnitude, magnitude. And this would give me the flux through this little uh, blue area there. So that would be a d phi now, a differential phi. This is the small contribution contribution of flux through only that little piece, right? E cosine theta times dA, oops, I still need that vector symbol, that's a dot product, right? So we can shorthand this. This is E dot dA. So the flux, I'll call it d phi, through just that little blue piece right there, we can describe as E dot dA. Then the total flux, well, we would add these all up. Integral E dot dA. And that would give us the total flux through the surface. So, long story short here about flux. Flux is field strength times area. You know, in a lot of the problems we look at, you know, this is good enough as far as calculating the flux. Field strength times area, but you need the component of the electric field that's perpendicular to the area. If the electric field is varying in magnitude or orientation with the area, then the problem requires more math. You break the problem up into little areas where the field is uh, constant over that little area. Calculate the flux through the little area sum up all the flux contributions. Now this can be an algebraic uh, type sum or it can be an integral type sum. I mean, it depends on how you set up the problem and it depends on how complex the problem is. So that's how flux is calculated. Uh, units, well, field strength is Newton per coulomb and then uh, area meters squared. So there's the units of flux, Newton meter squared per coulomb. And what it is, it's a measure or, um, that's related to the number of field lines going through an area. So as I look over here, I drew three field lines. And if I drew a few more, boom, boom, you'll notice that in my picture, there are three field lines going through the area. Now, that does not mean that if I calculate the flux here, numerically, it's gonna come out to three. It's going to come out to some number and that number will end up being proportional to the field lines going through the area. Basically, it means this. Um, let's say I calculate the flux and I get, I don't know, 20. That doesn't mean there's 20 field lines going through here. Right? It just gives me a number proportional to the number of field lines going through the area. Now, if I somehow uh, imagine doubling the electric field strength, then the number of field lines double. And that's because the field strength is proportional to the number of field lines in a given region in space here. So now what would happen is there's now, uh, should be six basically, field lines going through this uh, area. And if I were to calculate the flux, I would get 40. So the if I used a 20 in my previous example, my memory's not so good, but when you calculate the flux, you're just getting a number proportional to the number of field lines going through an area. It doesn't mean that it's the exact same number because the number of field lines that go through an area, that's going to depend on your drawing. In a sense, that's somewhat arbitrary. All right, so now we're talking about, uh, you know, what's the, the most important thing? What is this related to? Well, Gauss's law is what this is related to. So I'm going to take a moment here and just pause this video, draw another picture, and describe Gauss's law to the best of my ability. Okay, I'm back. Uh, picture on the left is uh, just a, basically a point charge. Picture on the right is just some sort of three-dimensional closed surface. It is, it is important to note that this surface is closed, meaning that you know if I put water in here, it can hold water in any orientation. Uh, Gauss's law is about closed surfaces. Now, uh, I'm using a point charge as my example, but but Gauss's law is true for any charge configuration. Doesn't it doesn't have to be a point charge, and there can be multiple point charges, and it can be a charge distribution, and, and it can be negative. I'm just using a point charge just for visualization purposes. So, if you look at this picture, and and we look at one of these field lines, right? So look at this guy right here. You know, this field line. I'm not going to uh, redraw, but imagine you know this thing extends out in space, and you'll notice it goes through my surface. You know, at a point maybe right here. Now. I guess I don't need that on right now. So this field line enters the surface. Now the field line entering the surface would, would really be a negative flux because remember with flux calculations, outward is considered positive. So we, we have a negative flux on this surface and that field line keeps going. 
and it leaves over here somewhere. So we have an outward flux over on the right. Every single field line that goes into this surface will go out and therefore the net flux is zero. Uh, guaranteed. Because every field line that goes in goes out. The only way we can have a net flux is if somehow we have field lines that that leave that never came in to begin with. Or um, that come in that never uh, went out to begin with. See, I don't think that one's possible. They have to, yeah, I guess that is possible with a negative charge in there. So anyway, the only way that can happen, you know, you know if you look at the picture right now, no matter how I draw this, no matter how I draw the field lines, everyone that goes in goes out. The only way that I can have a net flux is, whoop, here we go, if I, if I somehow move the surface over to here or move the charge over, it was just easier for me to, to uh, move the surface. So now I have a net flux. Look at that surface. And right now, every field line that leaves, you know, never came in to begin with. So now we have some sort of net flux. In case, in this example, that net flux would be, uh, let's just say eight. Now, if you calculate, if we actually calculated the net flux with eight, we wouldn't, if we actually calculated the net flux based on like point charge and electric fields on the surface, we're not going to actually get eight. We're going to get a number proportional to eight. But let me use eight now as my example. So right now we have eight field lines leaving. Now here's, here's a very important fact of life here now. That eight field lines leaving does not depend on the area of the surface. And you can see that quite clearly here. If I, let's say, shrink the surface down, and I ask you know, the viewer here, how many field lines leave that surface? The answer is still eight. And if I make the surface bigger, the answer is still eight. It doesn't change with the area of the surface. Now, conceptually here, how can that be? Flux is field strength times area, and the area is getting bigger. Well, as the surface gets bigger, right? You ha it's true that you have more area anywhere on that surface, but you also have a weaker uh, electric field strength because we're further from the uh, charge distribution. So they go up in exact, basically they change in exact proportion. As you make the surface larger, sure, there's larger area, but it's a smaller field. So it's important to note that the flux through a closed surface, uh, in a sense, does not depend at all on the size of the surface. It depends only on the charge inside the surface. If I were to say double the charge on the surface, that would result in me doubling the number of field lines at every point along here. You know, if I double the number of field lines, what happens is I would have 16 field lines now leaving the surface, which would indicate I've doubled the flux. And that's exactly what would happen because remember, the flux is the sum of all the E dot DAs summed over every point on the surface. Or in an algebraic sense, you know, imagine breaking the surface into little finite measurable areas here. I'll call it like A sub I, a finite measurable area. And at that location, there is an electric field vector. In my picture, it might point something like this. Right? Now we can call that an A sub I, or we can call that a DA, you know, depending on whether or not we're thinking in terms of algebra or calculus, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter here for this conceptual discussion. It's important to note that at any point on that surface, there is a normal, and it does not, you know, usually will not be in the same direction as the electric field. It can be, but usually it won't. There's, at all, all points on the surface, there's an angle between the normal and the electric field vector. So the total flux is either the integral E dot dA at all points on the surface, and you have to imagine this little area moving all over the place. and um, the electric field at all points depends directly on this charge. So basically, if we double the electric, if we double the charge in here, we are doubling the field strength at all points on the surface within the integral here. It's doubling this everywhere, and then you end up doubling the value of the integral. And whether you write it in integral form or in summation form, that's true, right? I could say that the total flux is the sum of all the Ea cosine thetas over the entire body. Now, oh, and that reminds me, there's a little piece of math here that I forgot. This integral here, you know, this is, a, this is the left-hand side of Gauss's law. It's important that um, the integral 
not just important, it is absolutely uh, essential that the integral is performed over the entire surface. So we normally put this little circle symbol on here um, to indicate that, that the integral is over the entire surface. Or in this one here, we just I'm going to put an S here, but this is over the entire surface. So double the charge, that means you double the electric field strength everywhere that has the effect of doubling the, the uh, flux. So Gauss's law is uh, basically this. Um, I'm going to write it in an algebraic sense first. Right? The total flux through any closed surface, which is the sum of all the Ea cosine thetas, I'll put, um, where the area is the area of a little piece anywhere on the surface, and again, this has got to be, I'm just going to put ES here for entire surface, the whole thing. This is some number directly proportional to the charge inside the surface. And I worked this out in the previous video, I'm not going to do this now, but the proportionality constant is 4 pi k. So this is going to be 4 pi k, a constant, times the charge inside the surface. Right? Or an integral language. And again, this is just basically the math way or integral way of saying the same thing. The total flux, which is the integral over the entire surface, E dot dA, is going to give us something directly proportional to the charge inside the surface, the proportionality constant, 4 pi k. Now, um, the 4 pi k. When you look in the book, there's a good chance in the in your textbook here what you'll see is something like this. Maybe charge inside the surface over this thing, right? This is epsilon sub L. It's called the permeability of free space. Um, it's just another constant. This constant is equal to 1 over 4 pi k. These are just different ways of saying the same thing. I just prefer to write Gauss's law like this. And the reason I do is because, you know, in Coulomb's law, it's the same Coulomb constant. The k is the same Coulomb constant. When you apply Coulomb's law, you know, the, the electric force is k, q1, q2 over r squared. Or the electric field due to a point charge, k, q over r squared. And you know, I just like to introduce, you know, basically one constant instead of two. So this is how I usually uh, write Gauss's law out. When you read it in the book, maybe written like this. So there's a little bit about, you know, just an overview of electric flux. And, you know, it's more, most important use here is for Gauss's law for electric fields. You can also write Gauss's law, you know, it has uh, applications to uh, magnetism. However, the equations are going to look a little different, particularly on the right-hand side. And we'll talk about uh, why later. Uh, you could, you know, most textbooks don't. But you can actually, you know, write some sort of Gauss's law equation for uh, gravitational fields as well. But... The electric field is the most, uh, by far the most common. And, you know, how do you use Gauss's law? Well, actually, let me back up. Where do you use Gauss's law? Usually, you're using Gauss's law in situations that have a lot of symmetry. So typical examples are spherical type problems, uh, cylindrical type problems, or uh, plane type problems. And I'll go through examples of each here uh, in other videos. And because Gauss's law needs a lot of symmetry to be useful, and the reason it needs that symmetry is because you need to be able to evaluate the dot product here, you, or the cosine theta. You need to know the angle between the electric field and the normal, basically at all or, or almost all points on the body. So it's very useful in regions of high symmetry. It's usually useful for finding electric fields, but can also be used to find chart. Oh, pardon me, charges and charge densities and things like that. So I'm going to save that for uh, another video. Uh, the how you apply Gauss's law, you because Gauss's law is a mathematical law about closed surfaces, you, you first start by drawing a closed surface that mimics the geometry that you're dealing with. And I'm going to, I'm going to save that for another video. Um, in fact, I think this one's probably got enough on it already. So I hope this helped demonstrate a little bit about... Uh, electric flux, what it is, how it's calculated, and Gauss's law. And, uh, you know, I think it's pretty important to understand kind of conceptually what Gauss's law is just saying. You know, total flux through any closed surface, very important that it's a closed surface. This is how that flux would be calculated, either algebraically or in uh, the language of integral, integrals and vectors. And, uh, that total thing is proportional to the charge inside the surface. So just, just conceptually that you have to have a charge inside the surface to get a net flux, I think is very, very, very important. And I'll, I'll talk more about, uh, I'll demonstrate more about how to use Gauss's law to uh, 
find mathematical quantities like electric fields here in the next video. So, hope this helped. Have a great day.